at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Well, you might have been getting some rain today and chances are increasing for our area as some surrounding counties start to see showers this evening. It's what we wanted with the drought conditions that we've been experiencing lately. All eyes are on the radar right now. Yep, let's head over to meteorologist Adam Kasky to see what's happening right now, Adam. Yeah, we do have some areas of heavy rainfall, some good downpours out there. Not drought busting rain, but drought denting rain for a few folks. You see a lot of white lines on the screen that indicates the cloud to ground lightning strikes and some of these storms, especially closer to the Gulf Coast are very lit up, particularly in northern Lavaca County and then even stretching up toward LaGrange. I'm going to turn off the lightning here because it can be distracting sometimes and we'll just focus on the heavy rain. Now this heavy batch of rain is moving right along I-10, Hallettsville, Toward Moulton, even Shiner about to get hit by it. This is moving westward, but only at 20 miles per hour. So if it could even hold together, it'd still be a few hours before it could get to San Antonio, probably about uh, two hours or more until it could actually get here. So we'll watch that. But out ahead of it, we've got this light activity along I-10 and even stretching into Comal County. Some of the heavier action farther to the south of San Antonio right now. And these red colors indicate the pockets of heavy rainfall not far from Campbellton, right along I-10. 37, but this is basically the epitome of the widely separated or widely scattered shower activity that we'll probably see developing again as we get into tomorrow. Pearsall area seeing a little bit, and that's because this outflow boundary is pushing southward and kickstarting these showers and thunderstorms that stretch all the way into the hill country and parts of Valverde County. We'll talk more about our rain chances for the rest of the night and into tomorrow as well and how much rain has fallen in just a bit. Adam, thank you. Days after the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, health care professionals are really looking at state laws. They're trying to determine how their care is going to change now. Yeah, fertility specialists across the country discussing the future of the way they treat their patients. Courtney Friedman spoke with a leading local voice in fertility and obstetrics about what the law means for his patients. 30 days after the Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade, a trigger law will go into effect in the state of Texas that bans all abortions except in rare cases to save the life of a pregnant patient. So does that law affect fertility treatments? And the Texas law, you know, specifically talks about a pregnant individual. And so um, as of now, um, you know, our understanding is, is this should not directly affect fertility care. Dr. Randall Robinson is the chair of the obstetrics and gynecology departments at UT Health San Antonio and University Health, and he's also a renowned infertility specialist. He's been listening closely over the past few days to colleagues nationwide discussing what would happen if this ruling prompted other laws that defined life as beginning at conception. Is that something you're concerned about um, when it comes to freezing embryos and eggs? I mean, I'm personally concerned about that. If additional legislation would be passed, that would make it um, a lot more difficult to provide that family building that we want to provide for our patients. But without the current laws mentioning embryo status or so-called personhood definitions, Robinson is continuing care as usual. You know, couples who, you know, are desiring to build their family, that would be the opposite, um, you know, of what we're talking about. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. It's your other news at six and right now there are 5,400 military members manning the stretch of the U.S.-Mexico border from Brownsville to Big Bend. It's all part of Operation Lone Star created by Governor Greg Abbott. But even with the enhanced security efforts, undocumented immigrants continue to seek asylum in the U.S. The latest efforts by the Lone Star, by Operation Lone Star, the installation of razor wire along the Rio Grande. In some areas, the river can reach depths up to 60 feet. So far, the Texas Military Department reports 350,000 encounters since the start of Operation Lone Star, which is in March of 2021. The humanitarian crisis is that these people are trying to get to a place and we need to make sure that they we you know, help them to get there securely and securely and safely, and that is handing them over to Border Patrol. Colonel Nolan goes on to say right now they're not on high alert for a mass migration event because Title 42 is still in place. Those are his words. Title 42 is the public emergency health order that allows the federal government to turn away migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border who are seeking asylum to help stop the spread of COVID. We've covered the topic in a case that explains episode that you can watch right now by scanning the QR code that you see on your screen.
Today was day four in the trial of the man accused of shooting and killing a three-year-old boy. Jurors saw Eric Trevino's interrogation video. A homicide detective was questioning him, and that detective took the stand today. Investigators say that the Honda Civic that's tied to that case turned out to be the same vehicle that a family member of Trevino's owned before the shooting. Investigators say that that vehicle was sold shortly after the shooting. And here's what Trevino told detectives about that vehicle. So you're saying you don't have access to a Honda Civic? I don't have access to a Honda Civic, so I don't have a Honda Civic under my name. I've never had a Honda Civic. Under okay, my name. and you did not shoot this three-year-old? No, sir, I did not. And do you remember where you were that day? It's a Saturday. Saturday, no, I don't know. I remember where you now, two more witnesses are expected to take the stand tomorrow. If convicted, Trevino faces life in prison without parole. The victim at the center of this case is three-year-old Rene Blancas Jr., who was killed in 2017 while he was in a vehicle with his family. They were using it as a dumping grounds. Surveillance video leading to the arrest of three people in connection with several hundred pounds of garbage illegally dumped in East Bear County. 22-year-old D'Angelo Over, 21-year-old Amber Hughes, and 21-year-old Raheem Thomas. All are facing Class B misdemeanor charges. The video captured on Chipping Drive near Gibbs Sprawl and O'Connor Road. There you see just they're unloading. The cameras were set up by environmental crimes investigators who were made aware of the problem in that area. Officials say the suspects were caught on video more than once doing what you see on your screen right now. A suspect connected with a fatal shooting from nearly two weeks ago is now facing murder charges. Police arrested 21-year-old Paul Terriquez Jr. for the shooting that happened back on June 10th. Police found 26-year-old Alexis Rios dead inside of his vehicle in the parking lot of an apartment complex on Whitewood Street. That's near Old Pearsall Road and Loop 410. Four days after, police responded to yet another shooting in a different location where Terriquez, they say, was found with a handgun that investigators say matches the very shell casings that they found in the area where Rios was killed. Now, the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office is still working to identify a man who was found bleeding out from a gunshot wound on the west side. That shooting happened before 8 o'clock this morning on West Cesar Chavez Boulevard near the I-10 Highway and 35 Exchange. Now, when emergency crews arrived, they took the man to a hospital where he later died of his injuries. Police found several shell casings in that area, but they have yet to arrest anyone. A troubled San Marcos police sergeant is now permanently relieved of his duties after an arbitrator last week agreed with the city's decision to fire him. In a defender's investigation, we found Ryan Hartman was controversially returned to duty in late 2020 after hitting and killing a woman while driving off duty with an open alcohol container. Then in January, he was suspended indefinitely for an unrelated rule violation like neglect of duty and bias based policing. The hearing examiner determined Hartman's discipline was, quote, fair and appropriate, end quote. He was a 14-year police veteran. Canyon Lake officials taking steps to prevent overcrowding and pollution. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers saying large crowds have caused a concern for public safety and the environment at Canyon Lake. R.J. Marquez visited the area today to speak with officials ahead of what's expected to be a very busy and crowded holiday weekend. Every single time we've come, it's been more and more people. I was actually surprised, considering it's not even the weekend right now. Yvette Tadea has been visiting Canyon Lake for years with her sons and says this is the most crowded she's seen the lake and park. The worst part is just people are leaving their trash everywhere. So we usually try to um, pick up some as we go. The same goes for Jennifer Lopez, who is a regular. I try to pick it up as much as I can, but yeah, there is a little bit more trash because people just leave it there or empty water bottles. And that's what Canyon Lake officials are trying to address before 4th of July. Even though we had the trash can, some members of the police, they put it side by side. Though. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Lake Manager Javier Ortiz showed us some areas where people are leaving behind large amounts of trash. Unfortunately, some members of the public, they go down and to the shoreline and leave all the trash behind. And Canyon Lake officials tell us that they expect thousands of visitors here to the park and to the lake this 4th of July weekend, which will be one of the busiest of the summer. And in order to take on this trash problem, they want people to practice what they call leave no trace. And that basically means that you are picking up whatever you put out along the shoreline. Another concern is people parking illegally on the grass. They start to damage the area and create 
say uh, environmental damage and the grass doesn't grow up any, anymore. Because of these concerns, Canyon Lake officials would now start to limit entry to the park when they reach capacity. Basically close half of the gate, half of the gate and have our range of just directing traffic for safety and security purposes down there. Yvette welcomes the changes to keep the park safe and clean. I really love that people can come experience something like this, but they're just being irresponsible with how they're leaving it. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Good thing to know before you go there this holiday weekend. All right, so now we're following up on the city of San Antonio's Ready to Work program. We've told you about it. It started six weeks ago. Almost 3,400 people applied. That program uses voter-approved sales tax dollars to pay for people's degrees and job training. Our Garrett Berger checks in with one of the first participants. Celestina Hernandez was a stay-at-home mom of four. Now she's studying for degrees so she can go into accounting. I wanted to show my kids that you can go to college and be whatever you want to be in life to reach your goals. She got into Ready to Work through Project Quest, one of the city's contractors in the workforce training program. She's one of the first few to have actually started her studies, but she is in the majority of those who have applied. And 69% of the applicants into Ready to Work are women. Most of them, the city says, women of color. It tells you that that subset of the population has been underserved for a long time here in our community, and they're excited about the hope that Ready to Work brings to them finding a strong foothold in our workforce. Hernandez had actually applied for Project Quest's usual workforce training program, which Project Quest says is essentially the same. Both Ready to Work, the city foots the bill, and Hernandez fit the requirements. So they put her in that. And if they need it, participants do have money available to help out with emergencies, whether it's child care or paying utility bills. Hernandez says she's already using that. My utilities, they're going to help me with it. With people rushing to apply for the program, which the city expected 5,600 applicants for in the first year, we asked if there will be enough funding. The city says yes, but there could be delays for applicants trying to get in. It might take a couple of weeks before that case manager gets to you and gets you intake into the program. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. For decades, a small area of San Antonio has been a meeting ground for the LGBTQ plus community. It's known as the Strip. It's on Main Street. There's a number of bars and clubs frequented by thousands of people each weekend, but it hasn't always been as welcoming as it is today. It came from decades of people being very intentional about claiming space in San Antonio. In our next half hour, KSAT explains how this area became the safe space for the LGBTQ plus community. Now we're going to take a live look, courtesy of Transguide right here. This is Loop 410 at Callahan Road. We showed this to you about an hour ago, and it looked busier. Now it looks like really hardly any traffic there right now. I mean, it's busy, but it's flowing and really no accidents to tell you about. So that's good. Now, to avoid traffic jams in road construction areas, we're going to have an update on the latest projects from TxDOT, and that is after the break. It's an out on the night beat protecting kids in schools, parents pushing for better security, and some want to be part of that solution. The proposal being made in Comal County and the Supreme Court's ruling on abortion leading to a legal battle in Texas. The confusion that's leading abortion clinics to stop those services right now and how that could change once a trigger law is enforced on the night beat at 10. So yes, we are fully into the summer now, which means more people are on the road, along with more construction work. Now let's check in with our Stephen Cavastos for the latest text out work that's happening this week. There are only a few days left in June, but we know that construction is going to continue into the month of July. Let's get a look around town and see what you can expect. Loop 1604 over on the northwest side. Yeah, this has been current, but bridge construction is continuing to take place on Friday. July 1st is when it should be wrapping up. But keep in mind, this is for those overnight or early bird commuters. Nine in the evening to five in the morning. Expect an eastbound main lane full closure from Kyle Seal Parkway to Chase Hill Boulevard. We're going to continue to see work here off US 90 in Bear County.
metal guard fence installation. This time it will last all the way up into July 1st, 9 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon, and it's during that time you can expect a single main lane closure in both directions there at Montgomery Road. We know that tends to be a busy spot for those early bird commuters as well. Let's get one last look here at State Highway 123 in Guadalupe County. Striping operations. This will start on Tuesday. That's June 28th. That also will be wrapping up on Friday, July 1st, and it's during that time, 8 in the evening, 8 in the morning, that is, to 530 in the afternoon. Single lane closures in both directions from Angel Lane to FM 477. But if you'd like to find the latest list of closures, grab your phones and open your camera app. Scan this QR code. That's going to take you directly to the KSAT traffic page. We have a list of closures that is updated each and every week. Just don't forget to scroll to the bottom of the page. All right, let's take a live look outside with live cam right now. Some dark clouds, yeah. and it seems like right now these storms are surrounding San Antonio, basically. They're surrounding the metro. Yep, that's our luck right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it really is just luck of the draw. And we had a few pop up, particularly on the north side of Bear County and north side of San Antonio earlier this afternoon. But now it's basically all around us, popping up, especially along the outflow boundary and just behind it. As you get down toward Pearsall, moving into the Dilly area and Atascosa County as well. So Frio County, Atascosa County, Zavala County started to see some of that action and then it stretches northwestward back into Valverde County and the hill country has been seeing some good soaking downpours. Just they're pretty short lived. That's the thing. I mean, it's better than nothing, but of course it's not a drought busting situation. One of the heaviest downpours that we have right now is in northern Lavaca County and this is now just north of I-10. So it's moving out of Lavaca County and just clipping parts of northern Gonzales County. I'm going to stop the radar and take a look at how heavy some of this rainfall is. Very heavy rainfall, probably on the order of uh, probably five inches or so per hour. We can check the rainfall rate. And within these purples, usually you have the highest rainfall rates. Yeah, well, five inches per hour. There we go. So it's coming down at a pretty good clip. Of course, it's not going to rain for a full hour <laughs> at that rate, but it could be just enough to give some impressive rainfall amounts of over an inch where we've already seen that in some locations. And you look within this area where we've had two batches of showers, the yellow indicating about two inches of rainfall. You get closer to New Braunfels, up to Canyon Lake. Canyon Lake, we've seen measurements of over half an inch and even radar estimates of over an inch on the southern shore of Canyon Lake. And I mentioned earlier, Northern Bear County. Here we go into Timberwood Park area, parts of Stone Oak, especially uh, Northern Stone Oak. But you get along Bra Blanco Road here and Borgfield Road, you know, Blanco Road under construction there near Camp Bullis. And you take a look at the rainfall estimate, 1.2 inches there near Borgfield, Borgfield Road. So some parts of our area seen some downpours today, but obviously not everybody's been getting it. So this activity is likely to stay scattered across our area, widely separated into the evening before it comes to an end later on tonight. I think our future cast is a little on the aggressive side here, starting at 9 p.m., still showing some moderate to heavy activity. I would probably cut that action in half uh, for what should be reality and then notice by midnight one o'clock it's all coming to an end. There's still some hope for you this evening, especially far south of San Antonio and east of town. Locally, I think our better chance comes tomorrow afternoon. So if you missed it today, another opportunity tomorrow afternoon. 8 a.m. Partly cloudy standard start to the day and then by about 2 or 3 p.m. We expect the ingredients to be there to start generating some showers and thunderstorms tomorrow afternoon and it's going to be a similar situation where it's luck of the draw more than anything and particularly luck of where the outflow boundaries from the storms that develop where they start moving and where they go because those outflow boundaries that gust of wind that you felt earlier today in town earlier this afternoon. That's what kickstarts new showers and storms. Storms. And I think we'll have some embedded downpours tomorrow with the potential of an inch of rain for some lucky and fortunate neighborhoods, but not everybody's going to give it. We're giving it about 40% coverage tomorrow down to 30% on Wednesday, 20% Thursday through the weekend. But I do think a lot of that's going to be far east of town. So we have this cool front that's been pushing southward. It's that same front we've been talking about since last week. It's helping to get things going today. And there's also this very unorganized batch of rain over the Gulf of Mexico that's going to be moving westward toward the Texas coast. 20% chance of tropical development. Basically, it's going to be a big swirl of rain is what we're expecting. And most of it should stay far east of San Antonio in the days ahead, closer to the Gulf Coast or along the Gulf Coast, really. 101, that was our high today, right before that front hit. Now we're at 82, but still 
in low 100s farther south and west of town. Meanwhile, Bernie 75, Bulverde 73. You can see where we got most of the rain. Temperatures are down. Comfort 75. Still some light rain in some of those areas. Here's your case at 12 hour forecast. 7 a.m. 73 and partly cloudy. By noon, we're near 90 and with an increase in the cloud cover. 2 or 3 p.m. is when the scattered activity should start developing. And that'll be the case on into the early evening hours. But once we lose the daytime heating, we start to lose those showers and storms. But most of us hitting our high temperature around 3 p.m. That'll be in the low to mid 90s and then under 100 really the rest of this week and into the weekend until Sunday. Nothing but sunshine and close to the century mark. That looks nice. We'll take it over last it week. Definitely. Right? Yeah. Hi, Greg. Hello there. So we knew this was a possibility. But now it's happened, right? The Texans are being sued. Well, the Houston Texans as a franchise are now being sued by the same attorney who handled the civil lawsuits and is all of fallout of what happened over Deshaun Watson's behavior. When we come back, we'll let you know what the plan of attack is and the first impressions of San Antonio by their first round draft picks when we come back. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Houston Texans are being sued for enabling their former quarterback, Deshaun Watson, during massages where he's been accused of sexual assault and misconduct in 24 civil lawsuits. Houston attorney Tony Busby filed what many believe will be the first of many lawsuits against the NFL franchise after he's already settled 20 of the 24 civil lawsuits against the now Cleveland Browns quarterback for his behavior. Today's lawsuit follows a New York Times report which says the Texans provided Watson with access to the Houstonian, which is an exclusive resort and spa where some of those massages took place and provided their then quarterback with non-disclosure agreements as early as 2020. Despite the fact the team had claimed earlier that the first knowledge of any possible problems came after the first lawsuit was filed against Watson. Here's a statement from Busby that was sent out today. Today we filed the first case of what would likely be many against the Houston Texans related to Deshaun Watson's behavior. Suffice to say the overwhelming evidence collected indicating that the Houston Texans enabled Watson's behavior is incredibly damning. We believe the Texans knew or most certainly should have known of Watson's conduct Beyond that, we believe the filing speaks for itself. All three of the Spurs first round draft picks were introduced here in San Antonio over the weekend. Number one draft pick, ninth overall, Baylor's Jeremy Soton made the trip along with his family, including his mom, Annetta, who played basketball at Oklahoma Panhandle State University before the family moved to England. They also got to see Jeremy's new home, the AT&T Center, together, along with the number 20th overall pick in the so-called steal of the draft, Ohio State's wingman, Malachi Branham, who, like Jeremy, got a photo opportunity with his family on the court, and the 25th overall pick, Notre Dame's Blake Wesley. As they were being introduced at a press conference this weekend, all three were asked about their first impressions of San Antonio. It's hot. It's <laughs> crazy hot. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, I feel like it's really cool. Um, I feel like there's a lot of culture, and uh, I feel like we can all you know, give something to the sea. And I, I can't wait to, to connect with the sea and the people of San Antonio. You guys, you guys, a couple Midwest guys, probably. Definitely yeah, so, yeah, I was about to say, it's, it's kind of like good just having nice weather, <laughs> especially in Ohio. It's so bipolar. You don't know if it's going to rain, <laughs> snow. You know, if it's going to be hot, it's just, it's, it's nice weather here. So I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> no, for sure. It is hot. Uh, I don't really like the heat, but <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, yeah, I'm from Midwest, so I like the snow. Got to cool down a little bit today. All right, here's a look at their summer league schedule. They'll practice for that starting today, in fact. So their first game will be on Friday, July the 8th, followed by the 10th, the 11th, and 14th, all, by the way, taking place in Las Vegas. Congratulations, San Antonio's own Jesse Bam Rodriguez, who successfully defended his WBC Super Flyweight Championship over the weekend against Thailand's Surikset Sor Ranvise, who was held in the new Techport Arena before a near sellout crowd on Saturday night, where Bam Rodriguez made his move in the seventh round, landing a clean overhand left that set Rungvise to the canvas. That's when Rodriguez let loose, forcing the referee to step in in the eighth to stop the fight, giving Rodriguez the defense of his world title by a technical knockout, making him the youngest world champion in boxing today at just 22 years of age. It was amazing, man. I've never had the support like that in any kind of fight. So to get that to get that support from my own from my own crowd, it means everything to me because every time I step in that ring, I support San Antonio to the fullest. And they had a near sellout crowd and a first boxing event that I know of in that new Tech Port Arena. Oh, definitely the first one. That's awesome. Had there. And, and, and that's what I was going to say. The crowd sounded great. Yeah, they're near sellout. Hope they bad. have more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back after this.
So this weekend was all about pride in San Antonio. Thousands celebrated. The it became the community's center. That's the strip on Main Street, just north of downtown. And this week's case had explains producer Dylan Collins shares the story of Main Street. The strip on Main Street is known as a safe space for the LGBTQ plus community. On June 25th, the Pride Bigger Than Texas parade rolled down these rainbow painted streets. It's a time that means so much to a community that has been through so much. Oh my God, you walking down the street hand in hand, you know, you'd be they'd throw a cup of ice at you out of a car window, you know? There were times back during the day when people were walking down the street where you might um, get hassled. But fortunately, that environment's not the same anymore. But why is this particular area of San Antonio the meeting ground for the LGBTQ plus community? And it came from decades of people being very intentional about claiming space in San Antonio. Melissa Golke is an assistant archivist at UTSA with a focus on queer history. She says in the 1950s and 60s, mostly white families began moving northward, leaving parts of the downtown area open for minorities and minority-owned businesses. One group that took advantage of the freshly opened space was the LGBTQ plus community. You can buy a house in the neighborhood back then for $50,000, maybe less. Low prices and open buildings were the perfect combination for the LGBTQ plus community to plant roots. As the 70s march on, more and more businesses open up and you have neighborhoods starting to form. We have evidence for these through a 1983 gay census that was conducted by a professor here at UTSA. That census was passed out during Fiesta events in 83. Surveyors got thousands of responses. It revealed that over 5,900 people identified as gay living in the Tobin Hill area. That is exactly where Main Street is located. The census helped business owners determine where their best clientele lived. For 38 years, Randy Cunniff has owned four of the five bars on what is known as the Strip on Main Street. He owns The Heat, Sparky's, Luther's, and Knockout, which opened in 2016. He also owns the name The Strip. There's also Pegasus, which is known for its drag shows and a couple of smaller bars down the street, Purgatory and 800 Live. But what you see on The Strip today has not always been this way. If you would see pictures of what it looked like 10 years ago, you wouldn't even know you're on the same block. Heat Nightclub was Randy's first business on the Strip. It used to be a boutique furniture shop in the late 50s, but the building was abandoned when Randy bought it in 2001. It was already kind of an area where there was three bars. They didn't identify it as that, because like I said, you know, people hid back then, you know, even 15 years ago, you didn't really call it that, you know, because you just didn't. As we built everything up and made everything noticeable and put trees and put this and put all that. The second business Randy bought was Luther's Cafe. It was a small restaurant that had been in the area since 1976. And although it was surrounded by gay businesses, it was not a gay establishment until Randy bought it in 2007. Another bar, Sparky's, has gone through several transformations over the years. It used to be known as Swank Lounge, where high-ranking city officials like judges and lawmakers would go to have a drink and gamble. There, was, there is still and was a, a tunnel type thing that goes out and go out the back. In the decades before the 2000s, bars were vital for the gay community. A meeting space to socialize, meet people, and just feel safe. There were no apps, there were no cell phones. But other than having fun, bars and clubs were used to educate during a very dark period for the LGBTQ plus community. AIDS was spreading like wildfire, killing thousands each week. During that period of time in the early eight, late 80s and early 90s of, you know, AIDS, yeah. And, and no cure and losing in the back of the Twit magazine was the obituaries. And me and a couple of friends would get together. I still get choked up and we'd see who died every Friday, you know, and we'd say, I just saw him, you know, a month ago. He looked fine that fast. Holy cow. Get pneumocystis pneumonia, go in the hospital and die. And you saw him a month ago looking fine, having drinks and whatever. Bar owners like Randy created a tavern guild to help educate the community, provide a sense of hope, and to raise funding for those who had succumbed to AIDS. One way they raised money was with the art of drag. But we had a bar owner's drag show where all the bar owners came and 
got in drag and we, we made money that night for, we raised $16,000. So it's not just a social space, it's now becoming a space of activism and action. And that continues up through the 2000s. That dark cloud would continue to hang over the community for decades and still does today. According to AIDS.gov, worldwide, 1.3 million people died in 2010. Progress was made over 10 years, though, that number was down to 680,000 in 2020. And while those numbers are still colossal, there is hope. AIDS-related deaths have been reduced by 64% since the peak in 2004. Much of that progress, thanks to the awareness and action taken in the early 80s. But in the following years, change kept on coming to the Strip. Spatially, it's changed so much. She's right. It's lost its, uh, its uniqueness. Because every year that I've worked here, I've seen a whole new group of people coming in. Now we're a place that, you know, everybody goes and everybody feels comfortable and all the gay guys and girls bring their straight friends, which is great. I mean, they always used to but not to the capacity that it does now. I know a lot of straight couples that will come out here um, because they feel safer here than in straight bars. With that change, one goal has remained constant, for Main Street to continue to educate younger generations. And I think about how to educate the, the young ones that don't, that don't even know what the strip evolved from. If you think about the history, now that you know what you know, when you're there, think about how that space came to be. Yes, it's changed, but it's still the queer community space. Wow, wow, we just learned so much. All right, there are so many interesting topics that KSAT Explains covers, and this is just one great example. If you want more, scan the QR code that you see on your screen because it's gonna take you directly to the KSAT Explains page on KSAT.com. July 4th weekend coming soon, but it's the cost to celebrate that might keep more people at home instead. How much you're expected to spend coming up? Also, more rulings from the U.S. Supreme Court. Wyatt ruled in favor of a football coach who was fired for praying. In what's being called a test of the First Amendment, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of a high school football coach who was fired for praying at the 50-yard line. The justices ruled 6-3 to three that the school district violated Joe Kennedy's First Amendment rights, saying... The coach's prayers amounted to private speech protected by the First Amendment. In the majority opinion, Justice Neil Gorsuch, Gorsuch wrote the decision based on, quote, mutual respect and tolerance, not censorship and suppression for religious and non-religious views alike, end quote. The Supreme Court declined to take Kennedy's case in 2019, but the court's new conservative majority accepted it this year. We know this, everything has gotten more expensive and that includes 4th of July celebrations. In fact, you're expected to spend 17% more this year because of inflation. That's according to the American Farm Bureau Federation. And according to its new survey, feeding 10 guests on average is gonna cost $70 this year, which is up $10 from last year. The biggest price hikes are coming from beef products. Two pounds of beef costs about 36% more than they did last year. Plus, you've got the chicken, you've got the lemonade, you've got the potato salad. Those things are also a lot more expensive this year. So plan wisely. We'll be right back. Now I'm hungry. Welcome back. So we got something today that we have been waiting for, which is why, Steve, you know, you've got that wide smile going. I, yeah. I'm just happy. I mean, okay, I didn't get a lot of rain in my house. I'm just happy we have rain in our area. Happens. Some people got it. Yes. That's the key. We can't always have it at our house, but uh, take a look at this KSAT Connect photo. By the way, you can snap your photos and videos and just go to our Weather Authority app and upload them there. This is three quarters of an inch of rain in Trinity Falls. This is far north uh, San Antonio and Bear County. And then this is a view from the distance. This is what we had today. The classic rain shafts, the downpours, where if it didn't hit you, you could look off into the distance and maybe see some of those beautiful rain shafts. And this is something we don't often see around here. This is in Concan. These, I believe, are the lenticular clouds or technically alto cumulus lenticularis. And they can only develop around mountains and then sometimes 
hills as well. And today in the hill country, it looks like we had some of those develop. I've seen these in person, especially Big Bend National Park around the Chisos Mountains. You'll see those lenticular clouds. Pretty cool stuff. We don't often get them around the Texas hill country. Bernie, 1.5 inches. That's actually Fair Oaks Ranch this afternoon. Poor plants needed it so badly, she said. And this is in San Antonio. Some areas of rain, the garden a little bit happier with just fresh water naturally provided by Mother Nature. You look at the activity right now and it has really started to slow down quite a bit, uh, especially locally and in the counties surrounding San Antonio and Barrick County. It's starting to slow down. We're losing our daytime heating. In turn, we're starting to lose those downpours and some of the energy for that action. Most of it closer to Victoria, Goliad, Beeville, get down into George West and then uh, LaSalle, McMullen counties. You're starting to get that activity now because of the outflow boundary pushing southward and starting to generate some of those storms. We look farther to the west and you get around Valverde County, parts of the hill country, some lingering showers up there in northern Valverde County, but not a whole lot left over. And we'll continue to see this action dissipate as the hours go by this evening. I think the future cast is a little too aggressive tonight with what we showed you there. So, but by midnight, yes, just some clouds lingering around. That's it. We'll start the day tomorrow, partly cloudy. Then by the afternoon, you have another chance. Okay, doesn't mean everybody's going to get it, but at least you have a shot again at some downpours tomorrow. I think around three o'clock, give or take, we'll start to see some of the downpours developing in a few thunderstorms and then it's luck of the draw. I mean, sometimes the luck of the draw just comes down to where the outflow from a thunderstorm goes, that puff of wind that they throw out. Sometimes it'll go south, sometimes it'll go west. That's luck of the draw. Nonetheless, some downpours are expected, so at least there's hope in the afternoon tomorrow. We're giving it about 40% coverage across our area of South and Central Texas, and then rain chances really fall off 30% Wednesday, 20% Thursday through the weekend. And that 20% I think is mainly for just locations far east of town. If you're closer to the Gulf Coast, you've got better rain chances for the end of the week and into the weekend. And that's because this cool front that moved in today, that's not gonna be a factor, but the main basically game changer for later this week is this batch of unorganized showers and thunderstorms from New Orleans, parts of Louisiana down over the Gulf Coast. This will organize a little bit more and drift westward toward the Gulf Coast with a 20% chance of developing into a tropical system. Either way, what it's basically just going to be is a big swirl of rain that's likely to then move into Texas, mostly far east of San Antonio, possibly making it to Hallettsville and Cuero, and then especially up toward Houston. So we could see a few more inches of rain close to and along the Gulf Coast from that moisture. Temperatures, look at the range here, 70s to low 100s. You can tell where it's rained and where it hasn't. 102 Catula, 102 Eagle Pass. Plus, we have that cold front that's pushing southward. But this is mainly, these lower temperatures are mainly influenced by the clouds and areas of rain. Converse 79, officially 82 at the airport in town. Castorville 91, Uvalde 89. Tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., 73 degrees, partly cloudy. By noon, near 90. Rain chances up to about 30% by 2 p.m., 3, 4 p.m., up to 40%. And that's where we'll be through the afternoon and early evening tomorrow. Temperature-wise, we'll hit our high close to 3 p.m. That'll be about 93 degrees. Under 100, not just tomorrow, but the rest of the week, temperatures remaining under 100. All right, Adam, thank you. We'll be right back. We've got a lot of activity we want to take you to now live. Some late breaking news right now in the area of Casson and Quintana Road. We can see ambulances there along with law enforcement, but we're not exactly sure what's happening. What we do know is that there are a large number of sections there that are blocked off to traffic, which is something that you should know if you're commuting tonight. Our Patty Santos is live now on Quintana Road. You're not going to see her, but you're going to hear her describe the scene. Patty, what do you see? Yeah, we're seeing uh, this is in the area of um, Quintana Road. This is right next to the railroad tracks. We are being kept at a distance right now, but we're seeing a heavy police presence. I know that our helicopter can see uh, all this police presence around a semi truck. We have seen several ambulances here on the scene, as well as uh, several ambulances that were uh, 
coming from the scene as we were arriving. We're seeing another emergency response of vehicle right now, uh, what looks like a bus uh, that's moving towards the area as well. We know that the sergeants that have the information on exactly what is going on are closer to the scene handling whatever is going on right here. We are waiting for a uh, public information officers to arrive and brief us on exactly what is going on. But again, this all involves a heavy police presence around a, a semi vehicle in a very secluded area of the city right next to some railroad tracks. We're going to continue to stay on the scene here and bring you more information as it becomes available. We'll send it back to you. All right. Thank you, Patty. Again, to give you a better idea of what we're talking about, we're talking about the Casson Road, Quintana Road area. Not far from 35 or 35 South and Loop 410 South come together. As Patty said, it's a very secluded area as we continue to have this video up uh, near some railroad tracks, but they seem to be looking at a semi truck out there. Yes. There are a number of ambulances out there. We have a lot of unconfirmed stories about what's happening, but of course we are not going to speculate until we get some confirmation on exactly what's happening, but it's obviously important enough that we felt like we needed to bring it to you before this newscast is over. So stay with us on air and online. We're gonna keep giving you updates and we'll be right back after the break. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you